as you're turning there, tell you the story about a Texas teacher who was helping her little kindergarten student get his boots on one day at the end of a wintry school day. And the little boy couldn't quite get those boots to go on all the way. And if you've ever had a, a real pair of cowboy boots, you know that those are a little more difficult to put on than your sneakers. So the teacher's working, and, and she, boy, they were tough. They, and she, she finally gets them all the way on. And she had worked up a sweat, and she almost cried when the little boy said, Teacher, they're on the wrong feet. She looked down, and sure enough, they were. It wasn't any easier taking those boots off than it was putting them on. But she finally got them off, got them switched, fought through getting them back on this little boy's feet. And he looked up at her and said, Teacher, these aren't my boots. Now she stifled the, re the, the desire that she had to kind of get down in his face and say, Why didn't you tell me that to begin with? But... She took the boots off, and the little boy looked at her and said, they're actually my brother's boots. My mom made me wear them today. <laughs> One more time, she battled with these cowboy boots and got them on the little boy. She got his coat on, and she said, now where are your mittens? And he said, there, I stuffed them in the toe of my boots. <laughs> now... This kindergarten teacher was experiencing what we might call a trial at that moment, a tribulation, and, and each of us might quickly identify with that kindergarten teacher. We go through those kind of things, don't we? But how many of us identify with the little boy who, inadvertently as it may have been, was the cause of those troubles and tribulations in the life of the teacher. The reality is we can all equally be identified with both characters in that story. All of us go through trials and tribulations. That's easy enough to see. But because of the battle with sin that each of us has in our flesh, we can sometimes be like that little boy, uh, not on purpose, but through our words, through our actions, even our lack of actions we can be just like that little boy. And, and the New Testament epistle of James speaks to us in both situations. He speaks to us when we're enduring trials, and he speaks to us when we're the root of trials in others' lives. So we need to hear the Word of God speaking to us in both ways. And so when we come to the Word, when we come to this, this series in James, we need to come with the expectation that God is going to speak to us. But brothers and sisters, make no mistake, some of the things we're going to hear God say to us is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be painful because James is a tough letter to hear. The admonitions that he gives to, to the people he's writing to, they speak to us today. But that is precisely the reason why we must hear the Word of God and hear this message proclaimed. Now, we're going to be kicking off a sermon series here on James that I've entitled, Putting Faith into Practice. And as is our custom, whenever we begin a new series on a book, we're going to spend some time taking a broad overview of the book this morning, looking at the background so that we might better understand the biblical text and the context in which it was written. So this morning, we're going to examine three things. We're going to examine the author, his audience, and his aim. So will you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's Word, James 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. I thank you, Father, that we can come to even just a single verse as a greeting at the beginning of a letter and see the power and majesty of who you are. 
Father, I praise you that your word has so much for us that we can plumb its depths and never reach the bottom, but at the same time, we never have to worry about drowning in it either. You have made it accessible to us. Father, as we prepare to begin this series on James, I do pray that you, you speak to us. Where we need to hear the sanctifying voice of your Holy Spirit, I pray that we listen. Father, where there's need for repentance in our lives, I pray that we do so. And Father, we want you to speak in a mighty way to us so that we might go out from here better stewards of the grace that you have given to us and bolder proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his mighty and powerful name. Amen. Now, as we see here in the opening verse of the letter, there is both a straightforwardness and a bit of ambiguity in the greeting as far as the author goes. He identifies himself simply as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, James was a fairly common name in the New Testament times, so uh, this is this is something that's pretty simple. He doesn't add any additional identifiers to himself here to tell us who he might be. Uh, there are some letters in the New Testament, such as the letter to the Hebrews or the Gospels, that are truly anonymous letters. They, they don't have an author identified within them. But James is different. He does identify himself right here at the outset. He calls himself James. Now, in the New Testament, there are at least five different people named James, maybe more depending upon how you count them, but at least five. They're, the first one, James, the father of Judas, not Iscariot. He's an ax, and, and he's only identified to make sure that you understand that the Judas he's the father of is not the betrayer of Jesus Christ. So he's Judas, or, or J James, the father of Judas, not Iscariot. There's James, the son of Zebedee in Matthew 10.2, who is, along with his brother John and the apostle Peter, part of that inner circle of Jesus's, his closest friends here on earth. There was also another disciple of Christ named James, who was the son of Alphaeus. And there was James the Younger in Mark 15.40. He's just mentioned in passing. And then there's James, the author of this uh, epistle, and also he's mentioned in Jude as the brother of Jude. So those are the five that we see. Now, it is entirely possible that there was some unknown or unnamed James in the early Christian community who wrote this epistle, but if it was an anonymous James in that regard, it would seem that he would want to give some more credentials about who he was so that his message might have a little bit more credibility. If I just say, hi, I'm Roy, and here's my message, well, okay, who are you? So I don't think that this is an anonymous James. Some people think it is. I don't think so. I think that this was somebody who could say, my name is James, and you know who that refers to. Well, really, that only leaves us with two options in the New Testament, James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, or James, the brother of Jesus. So we have to look at this and say, which one is it? Well, if it's James, the brother of Zebedee, we have a problem because he was martyred in A.D. 44 by Herod Agrippa. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred. Most people place the writing of James in the mid to late 40s. So this book was actually written after James, the son of Zebedee, was martyred. So that kind of excludes him as being the James here. That really leaves us with James, the brother of Jesus, as the author of the book. Now, during Jesus' lifetime, James didn't really care for his brother. Well, I, don't, I shouldn't say he didn't care for his brother, but he certainly didn't follow his brother's teaching. We know in the Gospel of John that John records that Jesus' brothers didn't follow him. They didn't accept his message. 
This was the kid they grew up with. How could he be the Messiah that God promised? He's no political leader. He's no military leader who's going to come and throw the Romans' reign off of us. He struggled with that. But following Jesus' death and resurrection, we know in 1 Corinthians 15 that James is among those who received a visit from the resurrected Lord. And James converted. James realized that his brother was, in fact, the Messiah who had been promised by God and who had come to take away the sins of the world. So James would go on to take a prominent role in the early church. In fact, he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, even heading up the Jerusalem council that came a little while later. That's no small feat because remember at this time in the 30s and in the early 40s A.D., you still have all the apostles. You have Peter, you have James, you have John. And yet, it's James, the brother of Jesus, who becomes the leader of the church. So he was very respected. He was very much thought of. And he oversaw the Council of Jerusalem that we read about in Acts 15. You see, what was happening is there was Paul and, and Silas were out. They were uh, uh, having wonderful success on their missionary journey, and something happened. Gentiles started accepting Jesus as their Savior. Now, Paul went to the Jews first, but the Jews were rejecting him by and large. They were rejecting Jesus. They were rejecting that message of the gospel. But the Gentiles were taking it on. They were accepting it. But there was a problem. There were some who said, before you can truly become a follower of Jesus Christ... You have to become Jewish first. This is really Judaism. This is the fulfillment of Judaism, so you need to be Jewish. And as we read in Acts 15, we find that many of the people in that Jerusalem church, it says we're of the Pharisee party. And you go, wait a minute. Jesus, Pharisees, they didn't get along. And that's true. But there were many who accepted the message of the gospel that Jesus was the Messiah, that he had come. But it was hard for them to let go of their Pharisaical past. It was hard for them to let go of the traditions they had. So what the Pharisees, who were now Christians, were saying is that all these Gentile believers, they first have to be circumcised, and then they have to keep the whole Mosaic law. And once they do that, then they can become Christian. Now, how many of you have ever heard somebody say, before I come to Christ, I have to clean myself up first? That was the message that they were giving. But that's contrary to the gospel. James did not side with them. He felt compassion for the Gentiles. And the decision of the Jerusalem council was actually pretty minor. They did not want to lay much heavy or harsh need on these Gentile believers, and they just said a few things you have to keep and, and you'll do well. So it is no wonder then that the Apostle Paul looks at James, the brother of Jesus, as a fellow apostle. That's how he refers to him in some of his letters. And, and you know, to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, by biblical definition, you had to have been a witness to the resurrected Jesus, well, James certainly was that. Paul says he saw the resurrected Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15. He had to be one who was explicitly chosen by the Holy Spirit, and he had to be working signs and wonders for the advancement and the corroboration of the gospel, all things that were part of that apostolic age. So this is, this is him. He's an apostle and his reputation for righteousness and humility were so great among the early believers, he came to be called James the Just. That was his reputation. Now, this James, the brother of Jesus, he ended up martyred as well in sometime around A.D. 61 or 62 during a Jewish uprising in Jerusalem. He was put to death by the high priest uh, Ananus, but the early church fathers all look at the epistle of James and they say that it was James, the brother of Jesus. So we can see that the Bible is true here. Now, the authorship of James is not uncontested. 
We need to be aware of that. We need to be aware that there are some today within the church who say, no, that wasn't James, the brother of Jesus. In fact, they say it's a, an anonymous writer. We don't know who it was, but it certainly wasn't James, and it certainly wasn't anybody named James. They just took James's name and, and wrote under it in order to give themselves the credibility to write to the church. And they go on to say, that really isn't a big deal because everybody was doing that back then. If you wanted to have your letter carry some weight, you just borrowed somebody's name. Everybody knew it wasn't you, so it's not a lie, and it wasn't meant to deceive. But the problem is, it is a lie. That's why we call it a pseudepigrapha, a false name. It's a lie. So we would be admitting that there are lies in Scripture. No, that's simply not the case. Generally, there's three evidences that people give for why the book of James was not written by James, the brother of Jesus. The first one is, if the author were indeed the brother of Jesus, doesn't it make sense that he would have mentioned that? That he would have said, James, the brother of Jesus, our Lord, and, and so that he could bolster his credibility? Well, that might seem like that makes sense on the surface, but it ignores who James was. He was a humble man. He was not a man who boasted of anything in himself. He was not a man who was going around dropping names like so many people do today. No, he was a man who was humble. He was just James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. I'm a servant. I'm a slave. That's the literal translation of that term, doulos there. I'm a slave. That's who James was. He was not a, a proud man who was trying to uh, make himself into more than what he was. In fact, it would probably lend more credence to the theory that this was not a true letter if the person had written James, the brother of Jesus, because then they're wanting to draw attention to themselves, and they're wanting to do that, which was out of character with who James was. Second, some scholars have pointed to a technical aspect of this letter, and they say that the Greek that it was written in is, is simply too polished to have been written by somebody who was the son of a carpenter who lived in Jerusalem in the first century, that this is really good Greek. The problem is, often the people that make that case are overstating it. Yes, the Greek is a little bit better in this letter than it is in some of the other letters in the New Testament, but it's not literary Greek. It's not high Greek. It's just a little more polished. The simple fact of the matter is, we don't know what James's educational background was. We don't know what he read. We don't know how he had been educated. We have nothing. So that argument is an argument from silence, which is never a strong argument to try to make. Besides, it's entirely possible that James used a scribe to dictate his words to and write them down. That, Paul used that from time to time. Others used that. They used the scribe to write it down. So the scribe's uh, words might be a little more polished, so that's a possibility. But finally, and this is the biggest reason why people sometimes say this couldn't have been James, the brother of Jesus, they see a seeming tension in James between Paul's doctrine of justification by faith alone and James' doctrine, which on first reading might seem to indicate that justification is by faith plus works. Now, we don't have a lot of time to get into that right now, but as we move through our study of this book, we'll see that that, uh, that tension that seems to exist there really disappears once we dig in and we look at it within its context. So none of these arguments give us any reason to get rid of the testimony of the early church and say that it must not have been James, the brother of Jesus. No, I think we can come to this text and say, this was the James we read about in Acts, this was the brother of Jesus Christ who was the author of this. Now, let's take a look at the people to whom he was writing. Who is his audience? Well, we see in verse 1 that he says he's writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. 
Now, this gives us a question. Is this 12 tribes, are these the literal 12 tribes of Israel, or is this a symbolic representation of the church as a whole? Well, there's no doubt that the book of James has a pretty Jewish overtone to it. You see a lot of that in James's writing, and that's, that's okay. That's what we should expect coming from the mid-40s A.D., from the brother of, of Jesus. We should expect that to be in there. Uh, remember that Jerusalem Council was all about the question of how much Judaism should the Gentiles adopt before they could be considered Christians. So there was a lot of Jewish uh, aspects to this, and that makes sense. Christianity comes out of Judaism. Yet James opposed all of those harsh and onerous uh, things that the Pharisees wanted to put on to the Gentile believers. James cared deeply about his Jewish brothers and sisters. He wanted them to come to the saving faith in Jesus Christ, there's no doubt. But he cared deeply about the Gentiles as well. And he cared deeply about seeing them come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior also. And that's the same as Paul, right? Paul in Romans says famously that if it were possible, he would trade his salvation for the salvation of the Jewish people. He said, I'd give it up. I'd be condemned to hell if it meant that my brothers, the Jews, would be saved. That's the depth of care that these men had for, the Jewish, believe, for Jewish people as well as for Gentiles. Now, the other possibility then, if James is not writing directly to Jews, then he must be writing to a more multi-ethnic church that was composed of both Jews and Gentiles. And I think we can see evidence for that here in the fact that he says, I'm writing to the 12 tribes. Notice he doesn't say the 12 tribes of Israel. He doesn't say the 12 tribes of Jacob, which is very typical when using that phrase. He simply says to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. The problem with this being strictly to Jews or to Jewish believers is that the 12 tribes as an identifiable collective unit had ceased to exist after the fall of the northern kingdom when the Assyrians came in and took them into captivity. Have you ever heard that term, the ten lost tribes of Israel? They're lost. We don't know where they are. They, they were assimilated into the Assyrian culture and empire. It was very different from the Babylonian captivity where the Jews remained distinct in Babylon and stayed to themselves. Within the Assyrian uh, uh, conquering of Israel, that northern kingdom, they dissipated. We don't have that anymore. So when in the New Testament time, by this point, and, and even in that intertestamental period, when people referred to the 12 tribes, they were looking at it as a future hope, that the reconstitution of the 12 tribes would occur when Messiah came. Well, guess what? Messiah came. Messiah was here. Jesus had come. And, and, and we see that he came and he established the church. Throughout the entire New Testament, you see the church of God is not God's second plan. It's not his plan B. God didn't say, oh, well, the Jewish people rejected me. What am I going to do? He started the church before the foundation of the earth. That is it. It's the church. And we have been grafted into the tree, right? That's what Paul says in Romans, that, that the church is grafted into the olive tree. We're all there. But then Paul goes on to say that the Jews who had rejected Jesus, hopefully when they realize he's the Messiah, they can be grafted back into their own tree. That's the language that's used there. So the New Testament paints this picture of the, of the church as being what... Uh, what God's plan really was. So if we take this to be indicative of only Jewish believers or only ethnic Jews, we run into a problem here. And that problem is that if 
if the 12 tribes only speak of the Jews who had converted to Christianity, well, the phrase elsewhere is used to describe Jewish people no matter what their belief was, unbelievers and believers in Christ. So James is either writing to just Jewish people, and therefore this is a very limited application for believers, or he's writing to the church. James, an apostle of Jesus Christ, leader of the church in Jerusalem, not just the Jewish church, but the church, is writing with that authority to the church as a whole. And it makes sense that he would want to talk to them who had been scattered after the persecution. Remember, after the stoning of Stephen, what happened to the believers in Jerusalem? They went out. That was a good thing because now the message of the gospel was being spread throughout the world, all around. Under the persecution, the church grew. And so it was that James is writing to the church in the dispersion. Now, knowing the author, knowing the audience, we can now turn our attention to the aim of this letter. What's the point? Now, anytime we begin a discussion of the aim of James, we have to begin by acknowledging this is a difficult book. This is difficult. It is a hard book to read. Its literary style is unlike any of the other New Testament writings. In fact, many people have kind of described its genre as being more akin to the wisdom literature of the Old Testament than the epistles of the New Testament. The wisdom literature, things like Proverbs in the Old Testament, a collection of sayings. And so some people on a cursory glance, they look at James and they say, well, it's just kind of a collection of moral and ethical statements that are given. There's no real organization to it. But the literary structure is actually not the biggest problem with James, at least as, as far as difficulty goes. A few moments ago, I mentioned about that seeming contradiction between what James is saying about justification and what Paul said about justification throughout his letters. Listen, if you were to go to James 2.24, you can flip over there real quick if you want to, James 2.24, and you read that verse by itself out of its context and out of the context of the entire Scripture, it says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. If you just stopped right there, you'd say, whoa, that doesn't sound like it ought to be in the New Testament. What's going on here? Is this really a contradiction? This, was, this has always been difficult, so much so that no less than Martin Luther, the great reformer, referred to James as an epistle of straw. He didn't like it. And he said, it's really a second-class book in the New Testament. Now, Luther did go on to say, I don't say you shouldn't take it out, and I don't say that you shouldn't read it, because there's a lot of good stuff in here. But he struggled with trying to make this fit with Paul. And, and remember, what was Martin Luther's whole point? Justification by faith alone. That we can understand why he struggled with this. When we come to these kind of difficult passages, and let's make no mistake, friends, this is a difficult passage. This is a hard verse to interpret. When we come to that, we need to take care not to run into one of two ditches on either side of the interpretive road. One ditch is that we just completely ignore it. We just don't pay any attention to that verse. We skip over it, we don't talk about it, we hope nobody else reads it, and, and we'll all be good. The other is that we wrench it out of its context and try to make it say something that it never was intended to say. Now, when it comes to that first ditch, it's a great danger for all believers, but I think it's a greater danger for preachers. Listen, it would be so much easier for me every week to stand up here and preach topical sermons to you 
on things that I like or things that I think you like and would want to hear. That's easy. I could do that all day long. But there's a reason I preach in an expository manner, that I preach verse by verse through the Scriptures. Because we are commanded to preach and teach the whole counsel of God. There are some things in the whole counsel of God that are hard to hear. And not just hard to hear, but hard to say, hard to preach. I, this is all I have. This is all I can do. I have to go to the Word. I have to preach verse by verse through it. Yes, expository preaching can be hard to hear. It can be hard to preach. But the fruit that it bears is so much greater. It bears the fruit that we need. Now, some passages in James would be easy to skip over. 2.24, right? We could just skip right over that and not deal with it. But on the other side of the road, there's another dangerous ditch, and that is of being out of context. One of the great principles of the Reformation as it uh, uh, pertains to interpreting the, the Word of God is what's called the analogy of faith. And the analogy of faith simply says that Scripture should interpret Scripture. When we come to difficult passages in the Bible, we just need to go to the passages that are clearer and allow those to interpret the harder passages. That's the idea. Charles Hodge, who was a great theologian at Princeton Theological Seminary in the 1800s. Some of you may be going, you're quoting somebody from Princeton Theological. Listen, it used to be a good seminary back in the 1800s. It may not be today, but it was then. He wrote his classic work, Systematic Theology, and he said, if the scriptures be what they claim to be, the word of God, they are the work of one mind and that mind divine. From this it follows that Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. God cannot teach in one place anything which is inconsistent with what He teaches in another. Hence, Scripture must explain Scripture. If a passage admits of different interpretations, that only can be, true, that only can be the true one which agrees with what the Bible teaches elsewhere on the same subject." Listen, if you come to a passage here, one little verse that seems to say that your faith is by work, or your justification is by works and not by faith, and everything else in Scripture says it's by faith, then we have to come to this passage and interpret it in light of the whole of Scripture. And that is what we will do when we get there. Now, overall, we're going to see through this series that James is not a random haphazard collection of sayings or of ethical pronouncements or of moral uh, moralisms. No, it is actually organized around a very central theme, and I think that it can be summed up in what the title of the series is, and that is putting faith into practice. And we can see very, five very broad ways that, that James organizes his thoughts in this way. First, he says there's the practice of resisting temptation. Now, the world offers to us every manner of sinful behavior and thought that you can imagine, and it's all right at your fingertips, isn't it? Technology is a wonderful thing. I love technology. I'm a gadget guy. I, I like shiny objects. My wife can attain to that. And technology has a lot of good, right? How many of you can remember a time when you were sitting around the dinner table and you asked a question, hey, where is this country? Uh, I don't know. What did we do before Google? I don't know. You just pull out your phone and look it up right there, you know? What did so-and-so bat in 1973? Well, you pull it right up. It, it's so easy to do. But with that comes the ease of access to all kinds of other sinful things as well. And the problem is that 
we are under the impression today that we can do it secretly. We can do it in the privacy of our own home with the shades drawn and nobody will ever know. But not only has the world made it easier to get to these things that tempt us, this world has also worked hard to normalize every type of sinful behavior and thought to the point where today the only sin that exists is calling anything a sin. That's it. So this is where we are. And as the culture around us continues to promote sin and discount restraint, we need to hear more the words of James about resisting temptation in our life and how to resist temptation by the power of God. Second, there is the practice of a working faith. I think one of the saddest things that we see in the 20th century in the world of evangelicalism is what has been called easy believism or cheap grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian of, of the early 1900s and who was uh, killed by Adolf Hitler in a concentration camp during World War II, he's the one who coined the term cheap grace. He wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. Listen to how he defined cheap grace. He said, it's the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how many times growing up in the 80s and 90s that I witnessed people go out and preach cheap grace and preach easy believism. All you have to do is repeat this little prayer after me and you'll be saved. Doesn't matter what you do after that. Just say these words like it's a magical incantation and you will be saved. And, and then I can just go on, put a notch in my belt, another soul saved, another soul won, and, and I can move on down the road. There was no discipleship. There was no follow-up. There was no getting them into the church to be discipled and to be mentored and to grow in their faith. It was, here you go, you've prayed the prayer, great, good luck. That is not what Jesus said in the Great Commission. He did not say, go therefore and get them to pray a canned prayer. He said, go and make disciples. Making disciples takes time. It takes work. It takes effort. And as a result of easy believism, as a result of cheap grace, there are many who are left with a dead faith that James writes about. James says it's the same kind of faith that demons have. That's not the kind of faith that we should aspire to. That's not what we should be going for. So let me be as clear as I possibly can here. Dead faith cannot and will not save. It can't. That's what James says. You know, the tragedy of easy believism, and that was something that Billy Graham called an epidemic in this country. He said that, that this idea that you could be a follower of Christ and not be obedient to him is an epidemic in our nation, in the world. And it led him to write the last book that he wrote, The Reason for My Hope, Salvation. It has lulled a tremendous number of people into believing in the false hope that Jesus is only interested in being our Savior. Did you know in the New Testament Jesus is called Lord 667 times? He is called Savior 27. That, doesn't, that does not discount the wondrous grace of Jesus Christ as our Savior, but it does emphasize the relationship we have with him as Lord. Third, not only do we see uh, the the practice of resisting temptation and the practice of a working faith, we also see the practice of controlled speech. In my younger days, I had a propensity 
to engage my mouth before I put my brain into drive. Some of you may be saying, when did that propensity end, Pastor? <laughs> the truth is, I still struggle with that sometimes. I still struggle with wanting to just respond right away and not control my tongue. How many of you can say the same thing? I think all of us can sit here and say that that applies to us at some point. And we struggle with it even though we know the consequences. Feelings are hurt. Friendships are damaged. Reputations are destroyed when just a few careless words are spoken. Even when you offer forgiveness and you receive forgiveness, so often it's hard to forget what was said. Is it any wonder that James says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire? All of us have been there. All of us struggle with this. And again, thinking about technology, the anonymity that we think we have on the internet has caused an exponential growth of incivility among people. You do not have to look very far. Uh, just pull up any news story. It doesn't matter how innocuous that news story may be. Pull it up and start reading the comments and start watching what people say to each other, how they rip each other apart, how they verbally abuse one another. They're using their tongues as swords, cutting one another up. Today, one of the most obvious ways we can stand out and demonstrate our faith is how we speak, not just to one another, but to the world. That is what James is saying. So James's admonition regarding the taming of our tongue warrants its application in our lives. Fourth, there's the practice of walking humbly. Now many of you know that I'm a sports fan. I'll watch anything, all right? I, I, and I come by that naturally. My grandfather was a sports fan of the first order. He would watch competitive tiddlywinks if it was on ESPN. <laughs> All right, he would watch that. I love sports, but if you've been watching sports, especially professional sports over the last 20 years, you can't help but to notice the increase in lack of humility among athletes. You can't get through a football game without a receiver doing a 30-second dance after he made a catch for a first down when he's dropped the 10 prior to it and his team is trailing by 21. It's ridiculous. This is what's happening. It's everywhere. But friends, what we're witnessing in the world of sports is simply a microcosm of the macrocosm. It is a reflection of the strain of pride that is in each and every one of us that's part of our humanity, part of our sinfulness. And sadly, that pride infiltrates the church often, doesn't it? How many churches make grand plans based on their perceived abilities and their perceived resources without ever giving credit to the one who gave them in the first place? They don't give credit to God. They don't say that this all comes from him. James reminds us of the words of the prophet Micah who said, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your Lord. That is what we are called to do. Finally, the fifth broad overview is that there is the practice of patience and prayer, and these two go hand in hand. Patience and prayer. Jesus told us in this life, we're going to have trial and tribulation. We're going to have trouble. The book of Ecclesiastes asks the question, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? In fact, he goes on to say, vanity of vanities, it is all vanity. Now, it can be easy for us to be patient and to pray when things are going well. But when everything is falling apart, when it is all coming down around us, how many of us can say, as Job said, <laughs> 
The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's hard. That's hard. But it's in those moments when the heaviness of life is bearing down on us that we need to cast our anxieties on Jesus because as the Apostle Peter says, he cares for us. He loves us. He cares for us. It's in him alone that we can find our rest and our comforts. And so it's in those moments of suffering that we discover what a soothing balm prayer is. And not just our prayer, but the prayer of others around us as they are lifting us up and holding us up. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James reminds us that our faith is a testimony to this lost world when we patiently endure the trials we face, never losing sight of the power of prayer. Now, I'm excited about what God is going to show us through this series. I I know that there are going to be times when it's going to be uncomfortable. I want you to know it's going to be uncomfortable for me too. I don't preach a sermon to you until it's been preached to me for a long time prior. All right, These things... That's the way that it works. But I want you to know that as God reveals areas in our life where we are in need of sanctification, he is going to give us the grace by which we can be sanctified. And we can celebrate that he is going to keep his promise, that he is going to continue conforming us more and more into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And so as we now are going to embark over the next several weeks into this book, I ask you, examine your heart. Are there areas within those five broad areas that I mentioned where you're struggling, whether it's a working faith or your tongue or patience? If there are, I ask you to pray now. Be praying for the Lord to work in you, to open you up, to hear his word, and to be sanctified by it. God is going to speak. We need to be ready to hear. Just as we saw in that that series on the letters to the churches in Revelation, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's what we need to do. But listen, if you don't know Jesus, if you have not made him Lord and savior of your life, this is all like gauze on a sucking chest wound. It's not going to do any good. All right? You need to know Jesus Christ. You need to have that regenerated heart. And if all you did was one day a long time ago pray a prayer and you've never seen any change in your life, there wasn't a conversion experience. It didn't happen. But I want to tell you the invitation is open to you today. It's open to you this morning, this very moment. God is drawing you to himself. He he says in his word that he will draw men to himself. Jesus has been lifted up. He will draw men to him. And so I'm going to be right down here at the bottom of the stairs. I want to tell you more about what it means to place your faith in Jesus Christ, what it means to believe in him and to repent of your sins. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the power of your word. Father, I thank you that the power of the gospel is your power to save, is your power to transform our lives as well. Father, I thank you that you love us so much that it is not only about saving us, but it is about making us like Jesus. Sin is so destructive. We see so much evidence of that in our world today, Father. I think of all the hatred that we're witnessing throughout our country, throughout our world. We see people driving trucks through populated streets. We see people shooting one another out of hatred all over some of the most ridiculous things. Father, our hearts break. But we also know that the only solution is the gospel of Jesus Christ.
It is the only thing that can change people. Pop psychology can't do it. Dr. Phil can't do it. None of these things can do it. But the gospel of Jesus Christ can. And so, Father, we pray for those who are boldly proclaiming the gospel, who tell people that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Father, not a cheap grace, but a grace that makes disciples. Father, we lift them up to you. We pray for their strength. We pray for their encouragement during these times. We pray that you bring a mighty harvest. And we will give thanks to heaven for that. As we begin to go out from here this week, Father, I pray that we begin preparing our hearts for the messages that you are going to be bringing to us through your word. Father, I thank you that it is so powerful, that it is so wise, that it applies to everything that we might face, that we don't have to go through this life wondering how to do it. You've given us all we need. Your word is sufficient. Thank you, Father. Help us to be the bold proclaimers of the gospel. Help us to be the light in our community. Help us to be the salt that so, is so desperately needed in our culture today. And we will give you all the praise, honor, and glory in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.